Hey folks, this is uh, Draft Dad here, and i um, bringing you another set limited guide, uh, primarily for MTG Arena, best of one, best of three, sealed, draft, you name it. This time we're doing Zendikar Rising. This is the new set that's going to be dropping here in about a week. Uh, we're going to go through some of the, some of the mechanics, um, some of the deck types, commons, what you should be looking for when you build a deck in this format. So let's jump right in. All right, so some of the major mechanics that we're going to see in this in this uh, set, if you've been paying attention, has been the party mechanic. But what they haven't really talked about is the tribal side of that mechanic. So there's going to be a balance here between uh, a full party deck, where you want rogue, wizard, uh, warrior, cleric, and the tribal style of deck, where you're trying to get all clerics or all wizards or all rogues, which I think are going to be the most powerful ones, at least out of the gate. The other big mechanic, returning is landfall. Now, this was in the original uh, Zendikar, and this made for an incredibly aggressive format. One of the most aggressive of all time. I don't think it's going to be there uh, this time. I just don't think it's supported the way that the creatures break out. I don't think you're going to see those completely insane black-red uh, aggro decks with geopedes and steplinkses and you name it. And Windrider Eels. Um, so I, I think uh, Landfall is still going to have a huge impact, but it's going to take more of a secondary place as far as mechanics is that. The other big one is these MDFCs. Those are modular double-faced or modal double-faced cards. And so these are spells on the front, lands on the back. So you have uh, business on the front, party in the back. I, I've heard a lot of different things for these, but these are incredibly powerful. These allow you to either play with 14 land in your deck and three MDFCs to bring you up to 17, or 20 land in your deck and three of them are spells, so you're actually uh, playing those as spells and you're only using 17 land or, or whatever it is. But these cards are incredibly powerful. They come one per pack. Um, so uh, they'll either take the, the rare slot, the mythic rare slot, um, or they'll take the uncommon slot in every pack. So you're going to want to get these in your first few picks, I'm thinking, because they'll get snapped up quick. But we'll talk about that later. Some of the other mechanics. Here you're just going to see the other side of, of Agadine here. Um, some of the other mechanics are the minor themes. Um, so these are primarily um, within green, which doesn't take part in the party mechanic stuff or uh, some of the more tribal decks. So white and red have a, a minor equipment sub-theme. Uh, kicker is something that all the colors have. They're all gonna have kicker cards. However, uh, this is they're mostly at home within blue and green. That's where you're gonna see a lot of the payoffs for kicker, um, which I think is going to be an incredibly powerful deck, and we'll talk about that one later. The other one is plus one, plus one counter. So you're gonna see uh, some of this in the Abzan colors. So white, green, and black, but primarily green and black are gonna have these plus one, plus one counter themes. I don't think this one is good um, uh, is as well supported, but I do think the deck will be able to come together. Lastly, there's this auto attach equipment. So red and white have some cards that benefit from this specifically, but I think all of the equipment is pretty good. Um, I think there's one red common equipment that's not so great, and then utility knife at common, which is the, the three colorless one, isn't great. But other than that, all of these equipment cards are pretty good uh, because they come down and they automatically attach themselves to a creature. Um, they do have pretty high equip costs, but their effect on the board is pretty powerful. So, All right, let's get into deck building here really quick before we launch into the archetypes and the colors. So with deck building, what you're going to want to do is look out for these MDFCs, these lands with spells attached, right? Uh, these are essentially replacing a land with a spell, which is a lot more powerful than getting a slight upgrade to your 23rd spell. So if you can get a land that's a spell, you're replacing a land, but you're also having this powerful effect, it's gonna make your deck mu that much more powerful. Because think about uh, whenever you're playing a game and you top deck a land, uh, how much better it would be to have a spell in that instance. Well, these allow you to do that. Um, sometimes they'll be in your opening hand. You'll just play them as lands, and you're happy about that. And sometimes you'll top deck one of these, and now you have a spell instead of a land and a useless draw. So uh, you're going to want to look for those. 
Another thing is landfall enablers. These are only really in green, um, but they are pretty powerful and they're the only way to, um, uh, to splash in this format is is out of green so they have there's three green cards that do this uh two of them are uncommon roiling regrowth i think is the most powerful one um and it's the only one at instant speed um so it can set up some nasty tricks if you've got landfall creatures held back um so you're going to want to look for those and i would take these before you took those landfall cards because landfall is on every color all right, but the enablers, I think, are going to be trickier to get because they're in green and because uh, they're primarily at the uncommon slot, the ones that put lands into play untapped. There's Reclaim the Waste at green, but that just puts them in your hand. And then party payoffs. So this is if it's tribal or the full party payoffs. These are another thing that you're going to want to look out for for direction when you build your deck, right, if you want to go tribal. If you want to go with the, uh, some of the party colors, you want to see where your payoffs are. And that's how you're going to want to tailor your your build. So I think these three things are the, the, the types of cards that you're going to want to gravitate towards at the beginning of the, de uh, the draft just to figure out where your draft is going to go and what kind of deck you're going to build. All right, so white. They are uh, about clerics in the party mechanic, and each color has three different... Uh, three of the four party members in it. So white's going to have clerics the most, a medium amount of uh, warriors, and a few wizards, and no rogues. Okay, um, But they have the most in cleric. Uh, for landfall, this is one of those landfall-supported colors. Um, I think Naya have a lot of landfall-triggered uh, cards, so that's going to be white, green, and red. Uh, if you're in a landfall deck, you're going to want to be base green and then either white or red. Uh, they also have that minor equipment sub-theme right here. Um, so there's a couple cards they have. They have a an instant that attaches an equipment to a creature. If it's a warrior, they also have Core Blade Master here, which makes any equipment uh, give a warrior a double strike ability, which is incredibly powerful. Uh, and white also has some decent removal you're going to want to want to look out for. I think Nahiri's Binding is one of the most powerful cards in the set. Uh, it's made a little bit less powerful because of those party mechanics where you can still, your opponents can still get triggers. Um, if you, you pacify, you know, a rogue, they can still get benefits by having a, that rogue still in play. However, three mana to shut down a creature or a planeswalker is an incredibly powerful effect at the common slot. So you can expect to get multiples of these if, if white's open. All right, let's get into red, another party color. Uh, and they are going to be primarily warriors. Uh, they have a medium amount of wizards, uh, a few rows, and no clerics. Uh, they are, again, one of those Naya landfall colors. So they do have quite a few landfall cards. Uh, Aquam Hellhound is a reprint of Steplinks, which was the white uh, one drop in the original Zendikar. I don't think this card's going to have as much of an impact in this format, but if you do have those landfall enablers, this thing can get pretty nutty. right? If you have Roiling Regrowth, this thing can attack as a 6-7. right? If you play a land that turn, then cast Roiling Regrowth, put two more lands into play. It's a hell of a beating. They also have that equipment sub-theme. This is the only uh, color to get a common equipment in it. Um, and they do have some uh, a lot of warriors. They're primarily warriors, which do get the, the benefits of, of uh, having equipment. They have a one-drop uncommon warrior in this set that when it dies, it deals damage to its power to any target. Fantastic spot for your scavenge blade to land. Of course, they also have a ton of removal. I actually highlighted what I think is the worst removal. Um, and this is, uh, there's a reason for this. So, this says Sizzling Barrage deals 4 damage to target creature that blocked this turn. Not target blocking creature. So this means it's already blocked. So there is a 2 mana sorcery speed uh, lightning bolt with kicker um, in red. Uh, it deals damage to any target. That's a fantastic one. There's also a... Uh, a three mana deal two damage or destroy an artifact removal spell at common. That's a great card as well, uh, which may have some applications if your opponent has like um, any of the equipment, the uncommon equipment. 
This one you're going to want to avoid. But it's, it's the wording that makes it bad. On the surface, if you just glance at it, you skim it, you're thinking, oh, okay. Anytime my opponent tries to block one of my creatures, I can just nuke it. No, they already have to complete the block for you to make use of this card. So, the, so a lot of times you just get two for one, or your cards trade, and you can't even use this thing. Or at worst, you know, your opponent eats your creature, and then you have to use this to finish off their creature. It's just not what red wants to be doing. All right, black. Uh, another party colored. These uh, uh, specialize in rogue. Uh, they also have a medium amount of clerics, a few warriors, and no wizards. Uh, one of their sub-themes is mill. So uh, the mill works a little bit different in this set than you're traditionally used to. Mill, uh, milling your opponent usually isn't the win con. What milling does is it makes your creatures able to attack better. Uh, buffs them up, makes them more powerful, gets this snowball effect going, right? Um, so an example here is as long as an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, Namata Skitter Sneak gets plus one, plus zero in Menace. So it's a four, four Menace for four, which in this format's pretty big and difficult to deal with, especially at common, right? Um, so getting your opponent to have eight cards in their graveyard is kind of the magic number in this format. Uh, and then it buffs up all your stuff. Uh, so they share this mechanic with blue, um, and then they also have a very powerful rogue tribal deck. So this is another uh, uh, deck to, to look out for. I think the rogue tribal is very powerful in this format. Their other one, other mechanic is shared with green and a little bit in white, uh, but the payoffs are mostly in green and black, um, and that is the plus one, plus one counters uh, format. So here's a, a common. It's a 2-2 two, two for three uh, that has menace, uh, which is mediocre at best but if you have a way to shuffle counters around or do whatever you got to do uh and give other creatures counters there's lots of ways to do that and then eventually you can have all your creatures have menace um and then there's ways uh to give them trample as well so this is another one of those snowball-y type decks as far as removal goes i think black has some amazing removal in this set uh there's deadly alliance which is instant speed i think um, it's four and a black, but you reduce the mana cost by one for each creature in your party, and then it just destroys creature. So it's in unconditional. Uh, another one is Feed the Swarm here, and this is one of the primary reasons I think uh, aggro decks are going to have a tough time in this format, uh, because this is a two mana, sorcery speed, unconditional removal. You do lose life equal to the permanent's converted mana cost. However, if your opponent's trying to beat you down with a bunch of landfall creatures... They're going to get big on their turn, not yours. There's still going to be little wimps on your turn. So if they're threatening you with, you know, the new Geopede or or whatever the creature is, you're going to pay maybe a, a life or two to get rid of that threat uh, for two mana, which is very efficient for you. Um, it allows you to claw back into the game. So black, I think, is a very powerful card in, uh, color in this format. All right, blue is the last of the party colors. They have the most in wizards, uh, followed up by rogues, which they have a medium amount of, and then a few clerics, um, and then no warriors. Uh, they have that mill mechanic as well. I took Glacial Grasp here um, because I think it's just a very interesting card. And, and it, one of the things I've, I've seen in this set is they're just combining all of the things into these minor effects, just a ton of incremental value into one card. They're just packing it in there. There's a few different cards like this, but Glacial Grasp, Grasp is that um, that freeze effect. So tap a creature, doesn't untap during its uh, controller's next untap step. Its controller mills two cards, and you draw a card. So when you combine all of those effects, you end up with something that's pretty good, right? Especially if your deck wants to be milling your opponent. So it's a great tempo play. The other thing they do is Kicker. Uh, and they share this mostly with green um, as far as the payoffs go, but all the colors are going to have kicker cards in them. Uh, Risen Riptide, I think, is pretty pretty interesting. It's an 0-5 for 3 mana, um, but whenever you cast a kick spell, it becomes a 5-5. Five five. And so you can beat down pretty hard with this card. There's a lot of cheaper kicker spells um, in this format. Um, uh, you know, just a, a 4 mana with the kicker. Um, 
Uh, so, so you can activate this quite a bit. It's not just going to be activated on turn six or seven. And there's a lot in green and blue. So you can expect to have 10 to 12 kicker spells in your deck. They also get some decent kicker removal. So Bubble Snare, I think, is one of the best forms of this that we've seen, of this effect. Uh, but it's essentially Capture Sphere. Uh, it doesn't have Flash. But uh, for one mana, you can tap Creature. Um, or, sorry... Uh, for one mana, you can enchant a creature uh, that is tapped and doesn't untap during its untap step. For four mana, you can tap it as well. So uh, if your opponent attacks something, just one mana and you can lock that thing down. And there's not a lot of ways to untap in this format. I don't know if there's any. Um, there are a couple of Vigilance creatures, but that's few and far between. So I think this effect is uh, incredibly efficient for one mana. And then if you do have the four man available and you have some kicker payoffs, you can use your value as well. So it becomes, you know, just a modular card that really fits what you want, whatever you want to do. All right, last up, we have green. So plus one, plus one counters. We talked about that with black. They also have some of the payoffs here. Um, Gnarled Colony, for example, this one also has kicker, but it's a bear normally or five mana. If you kick it, it, gets, it becomes a four, four. And then the subtext is, no matter what, if it's kicked or not, every creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it has trample. And so with those two commons, all of a sudden, we have all of our creatures with plus one, plus one counters have trample and menace, which isn't a difficult board state to achieve, right? They also get a lot of the landfall cards and the enablers. They're the only ones really with the, the decent enablers for landfall. So Canopy Bailoth, this is just a big boy. It's a 4-3 for four, four, but it's going to attack as a 6-5 most turns. If your opponent is silly enough to let it through and you have a Roiling Regrowth in your hand, um, instead of attacking it as a 6-5, it could be a 10-9, uh, which is a pretty big uh, a club against the skull, right? So something to watch out for when you let one of these through and your opponent has three mana available and they're in green. Uh, Kicker is another one. Um, so we've shown um, the, the Gnarled Colony, but also we have Reclaim the Waste. This is one of those fixing spells here uh, of note for this one it doesn't put those lands into play only into your hand but for four mana uh, if you kick it you can get two basic lands of any type put them into your hand for one mana you can just get the one land but this is a way for you to fix and splash and green is the only color that really does that of note they also get some decent removal rabid bites been around forever uh, they also have a fantastic mdfc um, land card um, that's the Kelney one where the it's a it's a tapped force, but on the on the front side it's a three mana fight spell, so that's a fantastic one, one of the better ones I think in the set, um, and uncommon. So they also have uh, some decent removal options as well. So let's get into some of the decks here. Uh, the first one I wanted to go over is Azorius Party. I'm going to go over these big party full party decks first. I don't think these are going to come together as often, but when they do, they're going to be incredibly synergistic and powerful, and they're going to be able to have some really nutty turns. So the sign pull post uh, gold card for this is going to be Spoils of Adventure. Gain three life, draw three cards at instant speed. Anytime you can get a card, draw a spell that's at instant speed, you're sitting pretty. For six mana, it's already a good effect. It's already definitely playable, but it costs one less for each creature in your party. And if you're living the dream and you have uh, one creature uh, and you have a full party, it's a two mana gain three, draw three spell, which is insane. Um, even if you only have a couple creatures in your party, it's four mana, draw three, gain three, which is still insane. So this is a fantastic signpost in common for this type of deck. Really goes over what this deck wants to do. Um, another great signpost uncommon is going to be a Myria Captain. It's a 4-4, four, 1-1 four, one, one Flying Vigilance Angel Warrior. So we have that typing, right? When it enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on it for each creature in your party. And that includes itself. So it's always going to enter the battlefield as a 2-2. Two, two. If you have a Cleric in play, it'll be a 3-3. Three, three. If you have the full party, it'll be a 5-5. Five, five. But most often, uh, this is going to be a 3-3 three, three or a 4-4. Four, four entering the battlefield with Flying Vigilance for four mana, so a cheaper Sarah Angel. Fantastic. Uh, especially in this format where the creatures tend to be a little bit smaller. Also has Vigilance, so it does a great job on defense. Just a fantastic card all around. Uh, the other one, uh, not as impressive, but still very important for this deck, um, I think. 
So Skyclave Plunder is five mana sorcery. Look at the top X cards of your library. Well, your X is three plus the number of creatures in your party. Put three into your hand, the rest on the bottom of your library. So it's draw three for five at sorcery speed. But if you have a full party, you look at the top seven, pick three from those and put the other four on the bottom, which is incredibly powerful. Because if, if, if you're in a position to be able to cast this spell, uh, it means you have an even board state or you're ahead on board and uh, you're able to look at, let's even just say the top five or six cards of your library. You're putting all the lands on the bottom and all the spells into your hand. So you're drawing action with this card. That's an incredible effect if you're able to pull this off. It's just getting to that board state, which I think this deck can do because it's very uh, defensive in nature. Um, and it has good defensive speed. Um, if you can do that, this card should win you the game. Just because you're drawing three of your action spells, you're putting three lands on the bottom of your library that you don't need anymore, um, and you're able to just continue the party, right? All right, so some of the tenets of the deck that you're going to see. Evasion. This is one of the better... MDFCs, it's a 4-3 wizard for 5 mana. Whenever you cast an instant sorcery or wizard spell, uh, this gains flying until end of turn. So this is a party member. It's uh, it's going to be triggered a, a large amount of the time. This is more of an is it based card, but it also has applications in Azorius. It's just fantastic in general. Um, and it'll get evasion and, and hit for 4, which is, which is a big body. There's not a lot of flying cards in the format that can deal with this. Another one you get is good removal at Uncommon as well. So uh, Journey to Oblivion here, uh, one less for each creature in your party. So it can cost as little as one mana for an Oblivion Ring effect. Um, uh, exile any non-land permanent, so artifact, enchantment, uh, creature, planeswalker, it doesn't matter. Uh, this thing gets rid of it. Uh, as long as it's on the field. And there's not a lot of enchantment or artifact removal in this format. Well, especially enchant removal. I think black has one um, that should see play. But other than that, there's really no cards that should see play that can deal with this. So, fantastic effect. And then they also have great tricks in this deck. So, Allied Assault, I think, is the best trick in the format. It's three mana. Two creatures get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures in your party. So, even if you just have two creatures in your party... You know, you have a cleric and a wizard out there. You get both of them plus two, plus two. This is essentially a two for one. It's done at instant speed. So if you have uh, two or three creatures or four creatures in your party, this is just a finishing spell. This thing can end the game. But it's a fantastic trick to have. I would always want one or two of those in every Azorius party deck that I had. So, all right. Next up, Rakdos Party. So... This one is more of a beat-down shell, a lot of removal, your typical black-red type shell. Uh, their gold uncommon is Ravager's Mace. So this is three mana. Uh, equipped creature gets plus one, plus zero, and Menace. Um, and it gets uh, a bonus to that for every creature in your party. So if you have a full party, it's plus four, plus zero in Menace, which is insane and turns any creature into a huge threat. A 1-1 one, one becomes a 5-1 Menace. So then your opponent's got to trade two of their creatures for your 1-1, one, one, and this card just runs away with the game. So fantastic card here. It's also cheap um, when you play it first for three mana, and it automatically attaches itself. So you just put it on your best creature, go to town. Another fantastic card here, Thundering Spark Mage. Uh, four mana for a 2-2 two, two wizard, deals X damage to a creature or planeswalker, where X is the number of creatures in your party. Uh, this is a Flame Tongue Cavu. Usually, and it counts itself, right? So, an of note, this is a wizard, right? So, uh, red specializes in warriors, black specializes in clerics. So, you're going to have mostly uh, warriors and clerics, or sorry, um, uh, black specializes in rogues. So, you're mostly going to have rogues and warriors in play. So, often this will hit for three because it counts itself. And that's just going to nug any creature on the field and give you a 2 2 body. So absolutely fantastic card. Uh, Thwart the Grape. This one is insane. So six mana for this effect is already awesome. But one less for each creature in your party. So let's say you have two. Four mana to cast this spell. Return target creature card and a party member card from your graveyard, not to your hand, to the battlefield. So this is a built-in 
two for one. Get two of your best things out of the yard. Um, uh, I think if you're going for these full party decks, your opponent's actively going to be trying to kill your party members. Uh, the weaker ones, it doesn't matter, just so you don't get those full party bonuses. This is going to get two of those creatures back for you, uh, which is backbreaking at any point. Uh, Thwart the Grave is definitely a first pickable card. Just fantastic. All right, Rakdos. So what they do, they specialize a lot in removal, beatdown, and aggro. Removal, I think this is the best removal spell in the set. Maybe one of the best commons in the set. Maybe the best common. Uh, five mana for destroy target creature Planeswalker at instant speed. We saw that in M21 and Finishing Blow. Wasn't that great, but M21 is ridiculously aggro. And in addition, this one costs one less for each creature in your party. So oftentimes this will just be uh, uh, Murder, if you remember that card, which is uh, three mana, kill a creature. But this can also randomly take out Planeswalkers as well. So it's just a fantastic card. Just an amazing um, common. So you can possibly get multiples of these in, in each of your, uh, your black decks. Beat down. So Shatter Skull Minotaur, I think I chatted about this one a little bit before in the payoffs, but it's a 5-4 haste for 6, which is fine already. Um, but if you have some party members down, it gets cheaper and cheaper. With the uh, if, you, if you have the dream and, and a full party, this is a 2-mana 5-4 haste. But oftentimes it's going to be a 3 or a 4-mana card, um, which is still incredible deal. Uh, it's a huge beater, huge in this uh, format where a lot of the creatures are small. Um, fantastic uh, uh, beatdown card. And then it's aggro. Uh, so you're going to have a lot of cheap stuff, right? So Malakir Blood Priest wins those racing um, situations. So, uh, and it's also a cleric, which is which is good to know. Because if it's not a warrior or rogue, um, if it's a wizard, which uh, red has a medium amount of, or cleric, which black has a medium amount of, you're more likely to have a rogue and a warrior on the field so this triggers for three so that's very important to know it's also a two one for two which is you know x ones in this format are not at their best but um uh, it's still relevant two power for two mana cheap little beater and then if you draw it late you're not gonna you're draining them for three or four and that's gonna win those race situations for you so it's a fantastic card it's at common uh, you should be able to pick up multiples of these so that's Rakdos. I think the party decks in this um, format, if they come together, are going to be fantastic. I think they're going to be a little bit hard to come together. The reason for that is because I think the tribal decks that we're going to get into are much more solidly and robustly built. So Orzov, Life Gain Clerics. So you're going to want to focus on all clerics or as many clerics as you can get your hands on. So white specializes in uh, clerics as their party mechanic, and then black specializes in rogues, but they have a medium amount of clerics. So the signpost gold card here, two mana, two two, just fine. Whenever a cleric comes into the under the battlefield under your control, gain a life. Whenever you gain a, a life for the first time each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on cleric of life's blood. So this card quickly gets out of control. It gains you life, it, it wins races, it sustains you, and it's a fantastic beater late in the game. Uh, what more could you want from a two-drop, really? So, uh, as you can see, we're starting off strong, uh, but it gets even better. Attended Healer. Four mana for a 2-3. Whenever you gain life for the first time each turn, create a 1-1 one, one white cat creature token. It also have the ability for three mana. Another target cleric gains lifelink until end of turn. So if you have both of these cards in play and you cast a cleric, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Cleric of Life's Bond. You create a 1-1 one, one token. And then that Cleric that you just played is going to get lifelink, uh, even if it has to trade for something. So it can do it again and get you more counters on Cleric of Life's Bond and, uh, and get you another cat. So it's absolutely incredible, some of the synergy in this deck. Scion of the Swarm. More synergy. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on Scion of the Swarm. This is a 3-3 three, three Flyer, Flying Cleric, for five mana. So this is an amazing finisher. Oftentimes it's going to be a 6-6 six, six or a 7-7 seven, seven within a couple turns. So uh, giving this thing lifelink and beating down with it is, is, is just out of control. So all three of these in comments are premier, first pickable, incredible cards. And that's why I think Clerics are going to be one of the strongest deck, decks. I think this, uh, uh, the Kicker deck and then Wizards are going to be the strongest. There's synergy all over the place. 
Um, we talked about those, those little ways to gain life. Well, we have a 3-2 for 3 cleric at common. Um, whenever you gain life, an opponent loses a life. And so if you're gaining life one, two at a time, this thing is draining your opponent multiple times per turn. So that's another incredible benefit here, not more synergy. Each one of these tribal decks also has a artifact enabler. And for the cleric deck, it's incredible. So three mana uh, for this artifact, two tap it, sack a creature, draw a card. As long as you control a, cr a cleric, you drain the opponent. So again, it's gonna trigger all those other effects. So your, your Marauding Blight Priest is going to hit them for one because you gained a life. They're going to lose a life, so they lose two. You gain one, and you draw a card whenever you sack a creature. So that's uh, an incredible benefit if they want to use removal on one of your creatures. So another fantastic enabler for this deck. And they also have some beatdown elements. right? I think Expedition Healer at Common is an amazing card. So a 2-2 two, two Vigilance for two is already fine. But if you control another cleric, this guy has lifelink, which, as you know, triggers all of your other clerics' uh, extra effects. So even if you're trading it off, um, it has lifelink, you're getting a cat, you're getting counters, your opponent's losing life. Just an amazing, amazing deck when this one comes together, and I think it's going to be very highly drafted. All right, wizards and spells. So wizzies and instants and sorceries. We've seen this quite a bit. In the Izzet colors, um, usually it's based either around non-creature spells or instants and sorceries. Now they're combining wizards, instants, and sorceries. So the signpost in common is going to be We Dragonauts, but you're going to add wizards to that. So a 1-3 flyer for 3. Um, whenever you cast an instant sorcery or wizard spell, this gets plus 2, plus 0 until the end of turn. Due to the nature of this deck, you're often going to trigger this multiple times. So you can conceivably or very easily be attacking for 5 with this on turn 4 in the air. So, a uh, great little beatdown card. Um, very fantastic in this type of deck. Another one, Windrider Wizard. This is a Windrake, so a 2-2 two -two flyer for three. Whenever you cast an instant sorcery or wizard, you loot. Um, it, pretty simple there, uh, but provides you a lot of card filtration, allows you to play extra lands in your deck. So if you play 18 or 19 lands even, um, this card can really filter those out. Uh, helps you dig for the cards that you really want that are going to impact the board. So this is a fantastic uh, little signpost uncommon in this type of deck. You should be able to trigger this multiple times a turn, right? Especially because every time you trigger it, you're drawing more cards. Another one, this one is huge. Rock Slide Sorcerer, 4 mana for a 3-3. Three, three. So it's a Hail Giant whenever you cast an Instant Sorcerer or Wizard spells, spell. Rock Slide Sorcerer deals one damage to any target. Now you can trigger this multiple times a turn and start hitting for two and start killing their X2s. This is one of the main reasons why X1s are not at their best in this format. This card makes combat horrible for your opponent. Um, and it makes all the, just pretty much blanks all their X1s. It's a definite must kill when they hit the, when this hits the ground or your opponent is in deep, deep shit. Uh, in your Wizards Is It deck, you can expect have 16 cards, maybe more, maybe 18 cards that are wizards, instants, and sorceries, because almost all of your creatures are going to be wizards, then you're going to have a bunch of instants and sorceries as well. Um, so this card is going to be triggered a lot. So fantastic card. Uh, this is a tempo deck at heart. So uh, one of the cards I wanted to highlight was a four mana, three, two flyer. This is a snapping drake. Uh, if you have another wizard, it replaces itself. And that's the kind of tempo you need because this is going to trade off a lot of times for a large flyer or uh, it has three power, so it trades up with, you know, a 4-3 or something. Or even if it trades even, it's going to replace itself and then you start getting that advantage, that card advantage on board. Um, and eventually, uh, you're going to just outdraw your opponent. And then you're going to get value from all of your triggers. Their artifact enabler, whoops, this is not supposed to be Relic Vile. This is supposed to be, um, uh, it, I wasn't very impressed by it. But every time you cast a instant sorcery or wizard spell, you put a charge on this, this artifact. Tap two in the card, remove all counter charge counters from it, deals that much damage to a creature or a planeswalker. Um, I find it to be a poor top deck. Uh, it's great in the early game, and if you can activate it twice, it's fantastic. Um, but uh, 
it's it's uh, kind of clunky, and it's only good in its in your opening hand. But it still has its applications. Uh, it, the fact that it's not an instant or sorcery or wizard, it's just an artifact, also kind of hurts it in this deck. But I still think it's a good card. All right. Lastly, tricks. This deck has quite a few of them. Um, so Chilling Trap. This is by far the best uh, version of this effect we've seen. We had Befuddle in uh, Dominaria, which was three mana for this effect in draw a card. This is one mana for this effect. If you control a wizard, which you usually will, uh, you draw a card. Also, it's an instant or, instant or sorcery, so it's going to trigger all your wizards as well um, and all your payoffs. So basically, you win combat, kill their creature, draw a card, and then you trigger all your wizards. can be backbreaking if applied right. And because it's one mana, your opponent can't really play around it. You know, Befuddle, when it was three mana, your opponent could could kind of figure out what was going on um, if they played Dominaria a lot. But here, it's one mana. Any one mana trick is incredibly powerful because you can't play around them, you know. All right, Rogue Mill. This is another one. Um, so, as I said before, milling isn't the win condition primarily. You can win by milling your opponent out of cards of their library. Um, but I think it's milling to make your creatures... Uh, beat down better, and then also for value. Uh, this is more of a control uh, style deck, as most mill decks are, most Demir decks are, black, uh, blue. Um, but uh, it does have a lot of beat down elements. The Signpost Uncommon, again, another fantastic card. So Flash Flying 1-3 for 2 mana, which is already fine. Um, as long as opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard, again, we're seeing that 8 or more um, a tr effect there, right? That seems to be the inflection point. Um, rogues you control, all rogues you control get plus one, plus zero. Whenever one or more rogues you control attack, each opponent mills two cards. Just when they attack, not when they deal damage. Um, so if you have this card in your hand, you attack with a couple rogues, you can play this in the middle of combat to surprise your opponent. All of a sudden, they're milling four cards. Or before attackers are declared. I guess you could say. So um, it has an immediate effect once it hits the battlefield and gets you to that eight or more cards in their graveyard. So if you play this before combat, let's say, your opponent mills then those four cards. Now they have eight in their yard, and all the, the two rogues you attacked, attacked with get an extra point of power. All right, here's another one. I think this card can be clunky, but it is fantastic. Uh, in the dedicated rogue deck. So it's four mana for a two, three, not impressive. Uh, tap another untapped rogue you control, can't be blocked this turn. Whenever it deals damage to a player, draw a card. So in blue, uh, black, there's a lot of control-y type cards. There's ways to lock down your opponent's creatures, kill them. So sometimes you're gonna be able to just get in with this, which is fantastic. But by tapping an untapped rogue, uh, you can just draw a card and loot with it and deal two. Or not loot, just draw and deal two every single turn. Fantastic. You're going to have tons of rogues. You're going to have 12 plus rogues in this deck, and I guarantee not all of them are going to be able to get in there. So uh, by making this thing unblockable, you can really go nuts. The other one is the wall. This is, I think, what makes this card, or what makes this deck incredibly controlly. So, and this is just on defense, right? So it's three mana for a one four. Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, they mill three and then tap another untapped rogue you control, it gains death touch. So if they try to attack into it, you have the threat of activation because there are multiple rogues in this set with flash uh, that are cheap, one and two mana. Um, so even if you don't have an untapped rogue, there's still the threat of activation there to give it death touch. And if you attack with it, because you want to get eight cards in their, in their yard, um, if they try to block... This thing has death touch, it's just going to trade for the best creature. Or it's just going to kill their best creature if they can't deal uh, four points of damage, which is a big-ass butt in this format. So another fantastic um, uh, uncommon here. So we're already getting set up pretty well. So evasion. There's a ton of evasion, and this is one of those flash creatures I was talking about. Flash flying for three mana. It's a 2-1. When it enters the battlefield, opponent mills two cards. So this is also working you towards your goal of getting your opponent to have eight cards in their yard. It's a relevant body. Uh, it has flash, which means you, the rogues before there, 
uh, that we were talking about. You can, uh, if you have that one four back and no untapped rogues, maybe your opponent thinks it's okay to attack. But if you have this flash card, and there's three different rogues I can think of, two of them at common, that all have flash, um, that are cheap, uh, you can just drop one of these into play, tap it, and give your, your rogue death touch and kill their creature. So it, it works off as a trick as well. Um, there's a couple different artifact enablers. This is the, uh, my favorite of them. Mine Carver is one mana for an equipment. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, when it ETBs, equip uh, it to attach it to a creature you control. Uh, equip creature gets plus one, plus zero. It gets plus three, plus one instead, as long as an opponent has eight or more that magical number of cards in their graveyard. Equip cost of three. So once you get your eight cards in the opponent's graveyard, which is pretty easy to do, I think, in this deck, um, every creature you control is a threat. So this Nemana Sky Dancer, instead of being a 2-1 flyer, it's now a 5-2. Must kill threat. Um, if you have that signpost uncommon to give your rogues plus one plus zero plus this thing, I mean, every single rogue you have is going to be five power or more. It's just insane uh, once you get to that eight card threshold. There's also a ton of payoffs here. The control magic in this set. Three blue mana is tough to come by, but this is uh, the deck that's going to want this card. If your opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, it costs three less to cast. Gain control of target creature with converted mana cost X. So what that means is if they have eight cards in their yard and they have a five drop in play, you tap three blue, two colorless, so five mana total, and you can take control of their five drop. So then this card becomes incredibly good. Before that, this card isn't great, which is a benefit for you because it's not going to be as picked as highly as some other cards in the set uh, because it really only works if your opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard. Um... In this set, we have cards like Into the Royal. There's also a blue wizard that bounces a creature. Uh, so its control magic isn't at its best in this set because those two cards are very high picks. And you'll see them in any blue deck, but you're in blue. So you're in a position to take those cards as well. So I think uh, in this deck, this card is going to be fantastic. A fantastic payoff. All right, plus one, plus one counters. So this deck is built around value and recursion. Uh, this is one of the less supported decks, but I'm hoping because it's less supported, you're going to see these cards going later and still be able to get into it. I think this type of deck can only support maybe one person at the table. All right. Their uh, signpost uncommon is fantastic, though. Yeah, this is an incredible card. Um, it's two mana for a 2-2 two -two with a kicker of three. If you kick it, it becomes a 5-5, five -five, which is a big beat stick. Whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on a creature you control, if this is in your graveyard, you can put it to the top of your library. It doesn't go back in your hand, but you're still getting a 5-5 five -five at that point. Over and over and over again, and there's tons of ways to put plus one plus one counters on creatures in this format that we'll get into. So this card can be insane. All right. Skyclave Shadowcat. Four mana, it's a hill giant, a 3-3 four, four, uh, three, three for four. Uh, sack a creature for two, put a plus one plus one counter on Skyclave Shadowcat. Whenever a creature you control with a plus one plus one counters on it dies, draw a card. So uh, given that we know there's tons of ways to get plus one plus one counters on your creatures, uh, you're going to be drawing qu cards quite a bit with this, which gives you that, a ton of that value, and it also serves as a sacrifice outlet. If someone locks down one of your creatures with that pacify effect or or the bubble snare, whatever, um, card, you can sack it, draw a card, and grow your Skyclave Shadowcat. So, um, of note, it also doesn't have to tap to do this effect. So, uh, you can do this as much as you want. If your opponent has a wrath effect, you can sack a couple creatures, draw some cards, recover a little bit quicker. Also very good, of course, against removal as well. All right, next one, Iridescent Horn Beetle. I think this card is fantastic. So it's a five mana, three, four, not impressive there, but at the beginning of your end step, you get a one, one green insect creature token for each plus one, plus one counter you've put on creatures under your control this turn. Since there's so many ways to do that, this thing is gonna spit out one ones like nobody's business. So you're gonna get a ton of them. Um, over time if this thing gets going. The fact that it's a five drop is a little bit tough 
um, because you're probably not going to have as many cards in your hand when you play this. So um, you're going to be top decking a lot of those. But there's lots of different ways to shuffle around or add plus one plus one counters to things uh, that I think this is going to find a home and it's going to create a ton of, uh, of little insect buddies. And then there's a in effect a Vastwood Surge in this format. Four mana, uncommon green card. Uh, take two basic lands, put them into play tapped, and then a kicker of four. Pay the kicker cost, all your creatures get two plus one plus one counters on them, which is obviously completely insane with any of these, right? Uh, it is eight mana though. Uh, what you're gonna see here is there's a lot of crossover on this deck. So with kicker especially, okay? So uh, uh, Ghastly Gloom Hunter. Uh, two mana for a 1-1 flying lifelink, which mediocre, but the kicker is four mana. Uh, if you do that, it becomes a 3-3 flying lifelink, which is a threat, uh, in a, an incredibly difficult to race threat, and it has two plus one plus one counters on it. So you're going to see a lot of those kicker cards that come to play with counters on them. Um, so you're going to be fighting a little bit with the, uh, the blue-green kicker deck for your kicker cards, um, which can be some trouble because I think the kicker deck's a lot better and you're going to have more players that get into that. But you can take advantage of all the black kicker cards that, that have this effect as well. Enablers. So Dauntless Survivor. We talked about shuffling counters around and just different ways to do it. Very simple way. You have a two mana, one, one. When it comes into play, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. Now, if you have a life linker like this Ghastly Gloom Hunter, you can grow it and it makes it even more, even better because it has life link and you're gaining life as well. It becomes more difficult to race. Uh, this is another good sacrifice fodder card, right? Uh, for your Skyclave Shadowcat. Um, uh, if, it, if you put it on itself and it dies, you can get your Moss Pit Skeleton back. So there's lots of different applications uh, that this opens up. And then removal. Um, so Subtle Strike is an instant speed, two mana spell. Target creature gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. This is the other big reason that I think X1s in this format aren't going to be as good. Uh, because you do this, you put a plus one, plus one counter on your creature, you trigger all your synergy, uh, you do it at instant speed. It completely blows out your opponent in combat. Sometimes this is just a, a two for one in itself where you kill an X1, put a plus one, plus one counter on your creature, eat their other creature. Just an amazing, amazing card right here. And you're going to want as many of those as you can get in this deck. All right, kicker. This deck, I think, is one of the more powerful ones as well. So ramp and kick. So you're going to want some ramp cards in this deck, and the signpost in common kind of uh, uh, points you in that direction. Um, so it's a three mana for a two four, so it's got a big butt. It can block. Fantastic. It also adds green or blue, so it ramps you as well. Whenever you cast a kick spell, you gain two life. So it's going to extend the game and allow you to, to take over with your um, powerful kick cards. Uh, the other aspect of this deck is value town. So Every time you cast a kick spell, you get tons of value. Uh, one of the best cards, I think one of the best uncommons in the set, is going to be Merfolk Falconer. Five mana, you get a 4-4 four, four flyer, so an air elemental, which is already an amazing card in Limited. Whenever you cast a kick spell, scry two. So by the time you're at five mana, a lot of times you don't want land, so you can put those on the bottom, put your kick spells on the top, keep scrying, keep getting your kick spells, keep getting more and more value from this card, it's completely insane if you can pick one of these up. Another one, more value here, um, Vine Gecko. First kick spell you, uh, you cast, it costs one less to cast. So every time you cast, you're usually not going to be casting more than one kick spell a turn. Maybe you do. Um, but when you do, it costs one less to cast. It makes it more likely you can cast a second one. Or you can cast uh, one on your turn and one on your opponent's turn if you have an instant. Uh, and it's a 2-2 two -two body for two, so it's a bear. Whenever you cast a kick spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. And in this type of deck, you can reasonably get 10 to 12 kicker spells. So this thing can get huge and out of control very quickly as well. So all three of these cards are amazing examples of what you're going to see in this kicker deck. All right, recursion, value, and more value. That's the name of the game here, and that's why I think this deck is so backbreaking to play against when it comes together. So three mana, three, three, already fine and limited. Just a decent beater, uh, very efficient stats for the cost. Kicker of two, so you pay five mana, 
return a kicker card from your graveyard to your hand. Any kicker card. So into the royal, you name it. So it can be an instant sorcery, a creature, any of them. Fantastic value for the card. And then, of course, this has kicker itself, so it's triggering all your other kicker payoffs, right? Um, and you're getting back another kicker card to trigger those payoffs again. It's just completely insane. Um, of note, let's say you're getting beat down pretty hard in the early game. You have to cast a spell without kicker, and that spell goes to the graveyard. Uh, this can get it back, and then you can cast that spell with kicker. So it recurs those expensive kicker spells that maybe you couldn't play with the kicker cost early on in the game, so you do get that extra value. Amazing card. More value. Roost of Drakes. I think this one is broken. So it's one blue for this enchantment, and I think you're going to be doing that more often than, than you would imagine. Uh, it, you, it also has a kicker cost of three. Uh, it, when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, create a 2-2 blue drake creature token with flying. So for four mana, you get a 2-2 drake and this enchantment. Whenever you cast a kick spell, create a 2-2 drake creature token with flying. Create a wind drake. That's absolutely unbelievable in this deck. Of note, if your opponent gets rid of it, you can get it back with Marasa Sproutling above there because it has kicker on it. Uh, if you have 10 to 12 kicker spells in your deck, you're going to have five or six drakes and you're just going to win. It's just going to win the game. It's incredibly hard to deal with because there's only one real enchantment removal spell in the set that's going to ever see play in Best of One on Arena. So this is just um, a bomb in this deck. And you first pickable, if you see it, just dive right into the character deck. This is an amazing card. Uh, more value. So into the Royal. I think this is Blue's best common. Two mana. Bounce any non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Of note, you can bounce your kicker spells back. You can save your own creatures. So um, you don't have to just use it on your opponent's stuff. If you kick it, you draw a card and get value from it. And you get to trigger all your other kicker spells. Right? So uh, Roost of Drakes creates a 2-2 if you kick this. And it's only four mana to do. So I think this is where um, uh, you start getting into the, the area where you can cast multiple kicker spells a turn. You know, if you have uh, the Vine Gecko... This only costs three mana if you kick it. So uh, you can see here just how how much recursion and snowball effects that this deck has. I think it's incredibly powerful. Just completely insane. If you can get into it, I think it's going to be. I would put my. I would bet that this will be the most powerful deck in the format when it comes together. All right, Naya Landfall. Um, so for this one. MDFCs are key. This is a beatdown deck, and you want to be base green. I think this is one of the less supported archetypes. Um, usually you're base green with either white or base green with red, but because you're base green, you do have the option to splash if you open up some, some very powerful cards that you want to splash for. So I think the key to making this deck work is Roiling Regrowth. Uh, because it's instant speed, puts two lands into play tapped, um, you can play a land at the beginning of the turn, so you're getting three landfall triggers that turn if you do this on your turn. Um, it can just end the game, right? Uh, so Roiling Regrowth, I wouldn't want to get into this deck unless I had at least one of these and probably another one of the landfall uh, pay enablers in green, whether it's Reclaim the Waste or Basswood Surge. Um, so let's get into some of the signpost gold cards. So Brushfire Elemental, I think, is the least impressive of them. Uh, it's a two mana one one with haste, which is which is fair, right? Uh, the haste can be relevant here. Can't be blocked with by creatures with power two or less. So usually if you cast it on turn two, it's just going to get in there and start dealing damage. Land, whenever land uh, enters the battlefield under your control, it gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. It becomes a three, three beater uh, and pretty hard to deal with. So you can expect to deal six, seven points of damage with this if you cast it on turn two. So good uh, creature, but um, we can do better. What I think is better is Marasa Root Grazer. Another two mana card. It's a 2 3 Vigilance, so it has decent stats for the cost. Tap, put a basic land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Tap, return basic land uh, you control to its owner's hand. So this enables you to trigger landfall multiple times per turn. Of note, because it has Vigilance, if you attack with it, you can then tap it 
and put a land from your uh, hand into the battlefield. So you can attack and drop a land into play and trigger your landfall uh, for the second time. So I think Roiling Regrowth and Root Grazer are going to be the two um, key cards that make this type of deck broken and powerful and beat down um, most reminiscent to what it was in the original Zendikar format. All right, Synergy cards. Skyclave Geopede. This is a play on Plated Geopede, which was a huge, huge beater in uh, the original Zendikar. This one's toned down a little bit. Uh, it's three mana instead of two. It has Trample instead of First Strike, um, but it gets plus two, plus two whenever a land comes into play. So it becomes a 5-3 attacking on turn four. It's kind of easy for your opponents to trade for that. Okay. Uh, it, it does have one toughness when a land isn't coming into play. So there's a lot of X1 hate that we talked about Subtle Strike, um, which is that common in, in our last deck breakdown. So it is kind of vulnerable, but uh, if this card is allowed to get in, you have multiple landfall triggers. I mean, if you cast Roiling Regrowth and you played a land that turn, so turn four, play a land, play Roiling Regrowth, this thing is hitting for nine trample damage on turn four. Okay, this is going to end the game. All right, another one is pick them up. Pick up the land. So there's a number of these types of creatures in these colors. Uh, Kazandu Stomper, I think, is a good example. I love this card. It's six mana for a six five trample. So huge body in this format. It has trample, so it's a form of evasion there. And when it comes into play, you return two lands you control to your owner's hand. Because once you have those lands in play, they're not doing anything for you. And once you're at six or seven lands, you really don't need that many in this type of deck because you're a beat down aggro deck, right? So picking up lands to re-trigger landfall is key. So you're gonna ha wanna have a few of these types of creatures in your deck. There's also some go-wide synergy in, in the green-white version of this deck. So Canyon Jerboa, three mana for a one-two, not impressive, but Landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, all of your creatures get plus one, plus one until end of turn. Again, with something like Roiling Regrowth, this card becomes insane. Uh, you play a land, you play Roiling Regrowth, and then all of your creatures get plus three, plus three until end of turn. Okay, that's crazy. That's an overrun effect uh, right there. So this that makes this card a must kill. Uh, so you can see how dependent... Uh, this deck is on being able to put multiple lands in play a turn. And that's Marasa Root Grazer, if you have the lands in your hand, or it is uh, Roiling Regrowth, right? At instant speed, and then Basswood Search can do it at sorcery speed. Uh, but I think those are the cards, and they're all at Uncommon, um, that are going to make this deck sing. All right, lastly, just to wrap up here... Um, when a new set launches, there's going to be those two weeks of sealed, and there is a difference between sealed versus draft. A lot of these guides that I break down uh, tend to get into the draft side of things more, uh, but with sealed, there's some differences. Sealed is more slow, right? You open six packs, your synergy isn't there as much because you got to deal with the cards that you're given in those six packs. A lot of the synergy and role players come from different commons, um, uh, which, which you're not going to have a guaranteed amount of. Right? You're just not going to see as many commons. Uh, so for that reason, uh, seal tends to be slower. And another reason for that is because you open six packs, you're going to get more bombs. In draft, you're only opening three packs. So you're only going to see three rares or be able to first pick a card uh, three times. Here you get six rares. So you're just much more likely to get bombs um, uh, than you would be in a draft. Also, removal tends to be more common. Removal is another highly sought-after resource in draft, uh, and so players snap it up very quickly. Here, you get to have all your first pick cards right there for you. So if you have a bomb in removal, you can just take them all out of the pack. Um, uh, removal cards are usually snapped up by pick three in most draft formats, so you don't tend to see as much. Um, and what draft does is it makes it so those commons that synergize with your deck build tend to go around a little bit more based on the open colors uh, so your decks are a little bit faster more synergistic but sealed tends to be slower splashier so you can play your bombs there's more bombs in the format because you open six packs and get six rares and then there's also removal because you're not fighting over it with 
with the rest of the table. I think the best colors in this format are going to be blue and black. So I would anticipate seeing a lot of those two colors in sealed because again, you're not fighting with the table to get the best colors, you're just taking the best cards. So be prepared for a lot of that blue, black, tempo control removal style decks. I think you're going to see some black, white clerics. I think you're gonna see some blue, green kicker, uh, blue, red wizards. I think the landfall decks, maybe green, white uh, you might see. I don't think you're gonna see a lot of red because it, it seems like the weakest color to me. So I think in sealed, you're gonna see those types of differences as we move forward. All right, so I just wanted to give that little rundown as well, but please let me know what you thought. Any changes, cards I missed, archetypes I missed. I know I purposefully skipped the white red warriors deck because I don't think it's very powerful and very supported, and I don't think you should look to get into it if you can help it. Uh, there's a rare that makes the deck pretty good, but I don't like to get into rares, and if you open them, and um, it's just too, uh, you just can't count on it. It's just not consistent. So I did skip that deck. I did that purposefully. Um, but let me know what you think. Thanks, folks.